Well, it's great to be here and to be at Safeco. My son was born here when I was doing my postdoc before my academic position at Davidson College. I'm from Davidson, which is in Charlotte, North Carolina. If it doesn't ring a bell, I'm at the school of Stephen Curry. So if that doesn't work for you, I'm a math professor, which if that makes you be begin to wonder where lunch is or want to look at the stadium, uh, Steph Curry actually took Calc 1 and Calc 2. So sometimes people find that intriguing. I'm not sure he's thinking of any of that when he shoots. But nonetheless, uh, that's where he's coming from. So when John and I talked about where I would go with this talk, because there's a number of directions, we decided that we'd talk about the ways that data can transform sport. And for some people, that almost seems off-putting in its own right. Because athletes are going to play. Some will think data, some will not. We saw that already in the video. And I will try to just show you the landscape of the places, the touch points that I've had working specifically with college students. Davidson College is a purely undergraduate institution. So everything you're seeing today is done by undergraduate students, which I see as relevant, particularly when I was at the reception, because many people are trying to enter in different markets. College teams have an interest in this. You, we do it entirely outside of coursework, so none of this is like a course project or something where I get students to do my work via homework, if you will. So let's begin to get a sense of who I am. So I'm gonna start with just a story of who I am to give you a sense, and I'm gonna take it back to when Davidson moved from the Southern Conference of the NCAA to the A-10. That was a huge move for us. And I worked specifically in the beginning with the men's basketball team. This is the program that Steph came out of. And at the beginning of the season, we were picked to be number 12. So we had to have like the ultimate foam finger to say we are number 12 out of 14. And in a sense, this wasn't that surprising of a pick because that move put us as the smallest A-10 school. We're just under 2,000, with the next smallest being St. Bonaventure at 2,400. Then you have VCU and George Mason, which are those behemoth-type schools to us, with 30,000 students. But by the end of the season, we were number one. We had won the conference. And behind that, in playing an important role, particularly in that season, was actually the Davidson Math Department which the New York Times picked up, as you see in this article. How? We weren't calling plays. We weren't saying what they should do. But our team in every single game was playing an opponent in a conference game that we had not seen year after year after year. We did not know every coach's intricacy. We didn't know the pattern of the way that they played. It's hard enough for the coaches to get ready when they are used to the teams let alone in this condition, week after week once we hit January. And the Davidson students, we had this down from the beginning the year before, that we supplied the coaches with what they wanted, with what they needed to get ready to move them quicker into preparation. And so that played a huge role that particular year in terms of getting things ready. That year we had four, and the next year, which was this year, we ha I had uh, 13 in men's basketball, 25 overall. So to give you a sense of the uh, students, we do not have the type of technology devices that, that we were talking about earlier with um, like the NBA, you heard some in Major League Soccer. There are a number of, of ones in that. I'm at college, so my students actually sit and collect data. So here we have three students that sit at the sidelines. We do have well-attended games. This is before the game. <laughs> and um, two of the alums of the original, we call our, ourselves Cat Stats because we're the Davidson Wildcats. Two of them work in the NBA now, one with the Mavericks and one with the Bulls, both in analytics. This summer, one student's working in the WNBA and another is working in the league office. And then the bottom is just to remind me to mention that we don't just work in men's basketball. We've branched out into soccer, football, uh, baseball, and we're moving into volleyball and swimming. To give you another sense of the types of things that we do, we do work outside of the college sports. We've helped the Hornets. We, op we help operate the sport view cameras, which I'll refer to more in a moment, which are the spatial tracking devices. We work for the NBA League Office, which I'll mention more later. That actually has to do with officiating, which Don Garber just talked about in the MLS setting. We've helped us, the 76ers. The fantasy sites are interesting because they like to have the math students and myself working on the salary, uh, the salary algorithm, uh, the salary setting algorithms for them. 
If you don't know Charlotte, I'm in the home of NASCAR. A lot of NASCAR shops are just north and south. And then finally, we were the analytics engine behind the German national team uh, last year in the big uh, fall tournament. We also help national media sites. We've, put, we've had articles, collaborated with articles for ESPN Magazine. When sports science gets stuck on their analytics, they call, and that is always, uh, can you help do this at the last minute, which is both fun and hard at the same time. We've helped with analytics on b-ball breakdown and written articles for nylon calculus if you're a basketball fan, and then the New York Times has called and asked for help with analytics as well. So this is the small school, 20, tw two, just under 2,000 students. And yet we can have this impact, and in particular, given today and given this setting, we're able to have this impact because it is today, because we have the data and the resources available that allow us to use mathematics and computer science to use both the rigor of our training and the ingenuity of insight. And that's really what I want to point out today, is that the transformation at one level is because of the data, but the data will never be the transformative part of anything. It's the insight that makes the transformation. And so when we talk about all of this, we first have to talk about where are you getting the data? And as we've already heard, there are many, many choices in terms of where to get data. And many times we move between different sources depending on the question that we're trying to answer, particularly for the coaches. To give you the sense of two data sources, the NBA, I hope you can see it on the slide, it's there, but it can be hard to see when you don't know what you're looking for. There's a small camera in the rafter. Do you see that in the slide? Up at, looking down on the Bulls stadium. Though that's sport view. If you haven't heard of sport view, they're large data sets. They take 25 frames per second. It's one line per, per frame, if you will. It's X, Y coordinate of every player, and then the X, Y, Z of the ball. That's it. That's all you have. Now, I don't know how well you remember math class, but do you remember x, y, where you have the coordinate plane, you put it somewhere? x, y, z, you get another coordinate plane, it's just out there in 3D. How do you even know the ball went in? I mean, think of all the different ways a ball goes in. How do you know the ball went in, let alone where someone's covering someone? It was just mentioned in terms of they'll actually try to think through where should I be covering you versus where I was. How do you do that? All of that is where math and computer science begin to move in, using machine learning, data mining, and all of those types of techniques. Missile tech is because uh, the um, sport view cameras used missile technology and adapted it to sport. Six cameras are used in the NBA. Four cameras were used for soccer, just because it's more spaced out. And then this fall, we're going to introduce, or the NFL is going to introduce uh, RFID devices to give spatial information in football. And uh, we're lucky to be able to work on some of that this summer. And it'll have the same resolution in terms of temporal data, in terms of 25 frames per second. OK, so let's talk about ways that things can be transformed. So we're going to start at the team level, because that's really the largest level that we work with. We work largely with the team. I was interested in the video that we just saw that people were talking a lot at the player level. We rarely, rarely give data directly to the player. We give it to the coaches who then decide what goes to the player. The most transformative moment for us in anything we do is the first time we meet the coach. Any coach at any level that we work with, is the first question is, what do you need? I don't say anything about what we've done. I don't say anything about what we can do. I want to know, what do you want? Maybe we can do it, maybe we can't. But what do you want? Help me understand you. What are you already doing that uses numbers? Sometimes that's a little too, a little too general, but that's generally the way it starts. Data analytics, in my mind, when it's just force-fed to show the ingenuity of my PhD degree, is not helpful. It's not helpful because that should never be the role of sports analytics. The point is, what can I do to further you down the road? So let's look at three examples of what we do at the team level. Did I hit it? The first one, there we go. This is the largest one, is in game prep. The largest thing we do is we have four different things, maybe more than that, but four specific ones that we tend to give the coaches the moment the previous game is over. That helps them think through, what will we do when we play the next team? 
The next team may be tall. The next team may be physical. The next team may be quick. We prepare for that game. We make strategies for that game based on who they are. And this is college, where every four years, the whole team is different. So things change from year to year, and we learn more as the season unfolds. The stopwatch is on there simply to remind me to tell you that the main purpose of our work is to save the coaches time. We do give them new insight, but much of what we do is speed things up. The initial impact that we had, the way they would talk about it, is they would talk about that our main role was that when they went to tape, they already knew what they were looking for. They weren't going to tape trying to figure out what to look for. So on the right, you see Bob McKillop, our head coach. And to your left is uh, Matt McKillop, his son, who is the lead assistant coach. Matt is the one that we primarily work with. We, we're even in contact over the summer because that's when we have time to begin to plan for the next season. So he gave this quote to the New York Times. When we first met in Unfold, as we listened initially to what he wanted, and then we talked about how we could do it, he talks about that it kind of blew us away. It really opened our eyes. It didn't open their eyes to how to coach. That's ridiculous. It's an incredibly successful program. But it did open their eyes to a new way to get ready to, for game preparation for them. And it does impact game time in terms of decisions. That I tend to be careful on because that's really their choice. I always tell my students, though, if a coach ever makes a choice that does not match your data, they are not wrong. Because the data that you have and the decisions you make are a model and they're an opinion. And they're always wrong to some extent, always. They're never fully correct any more than a coaching decision. Finally, with the off season, on the top you see um, a lineup efficiency where it shows for a graduating player. Here we see Brian Sullivan when he's on and off the court, the impact. And then below is a heat map. If you know basketball, you would probably argue that that's not a helpful heat map. That's precisely why the coaches approved this heat map. This is for all players over all games, and this would never be one we would look at. But it gives you a sense, and we wrote our own code to do both of these. The one on the top is automated off of play-by-play, -play, and the one on the bottom is actually hand-entered by the students. All right, so how about fans? I'll do these rather quickly. The first thing with fans is that they're increasingly willing to learn about the team with data. So here they're learning about one of our players, and then in the bottom, you see me in the uh, athletic club area that we have interacting with fans to talk about different data points. Students, of course, do that with me. And then this, I, I know you can't read the slide, but these are data points that the students create to help people scout the team we're about to play. And many fans walk up to watch this, which is a whole new thing for us and them as well. One quick thing that I found that just touches on kind of the fantasy aspect is using data to kind of get in the game. I do that via bracketology, which was the way I moved into math and sports. I do a lot with March Madness, with the coverage that you see underneath. And then we adapted it in 2014 to FIFA, with people over 80 countries interacting with our code that was online. So the league level is the one that I have the least impact on. Um, this picture was one that I liked, but I realized there are mistakes on it. I'm a Steph Curry fan, thus a Warriors fan, so I did make one correction. But <laughs> nonetheless, all right, sorry. but. Uh, and one of the big areas that was already mentioned, but I didn't know that it would be, is in officiating. That's the one we do for the league office. The idea there is it's not necessarily an area that they think is a problem, but they're trying to check different ways that officials are working because they are also tracked in the sport view data. But only the league office gets the tracking of the referees, not the teams. Another one that's an interesting application is in scheduling, trying to think through what's a fair load of travel for the teams. And it's an issue both in the NFL and the NBA. And that was a uh, leading research paper in the Sloan meeting uh, two years ago, if you wanted to look at that. And that connects to what's called the traveling salesman problem, which you see here. So if, if you know of that, it connects to that type of issue. The last thing in here is that it connects to new analytics that fans can engage in. The one with Dennis Rodman is an analytic that they introduced last summer, which was hustle stat. Many sports analyst types aren't really sure it's measuring hustle, but then they'll quickly say that they actually like what it's measuring. Then we see baseball, which we heard earlier in terms of how fast someone is running and where they're catching it, how hard it was hit, and all of that to augment, again, the experience that we see. In terms of athletes, I just have a couple, and then I'll pretty much be done. 
One of the first ways is that you can actually track, this is done by various college teams, it's not really a new thing, but it does involve data, is that you track the drills that you're running and then its impact on performance. You run specific drills to get ready for specific teams and are they really having the correlation that you expect? You do have to give access to practice though if you're gonna have a sports analyst do that. Injury prevention has been mentioned through the morning and that often moves into biometric um, data as well. Here, one of our students looked at release point um, using pitch FX uh, to try to uh, track fatigue in a player. Then this slide was actually one I mentioned right at the beginning. Not every player, not every coach wants as much data as the next. If you want to be transformative in your use, then it has to be tailor-made for the person that you're working with, the athlete or the other. This is true at the NBA level all the way down to the college level and below is that, that if you're gonna use data, you coach with it so you make it applicable. So these are my three things in terms of what I would say make sports analytics um, applicable, and this is the types of things that when people try to get into it, I try to push. First is that it's coachable, which means it's actionable if you're in business. Second, it's consumable, that people want what you're actually producing. You're not, I mean, we're math, we're math students and I'm a math prof. We like esoteric problems, but not in this context. Finally, is that it's understandable so that it can be consumed, it can be understood, and therefore it can also be overridden in an informed way. I know the boundaries of what you're saying. I know the context of the way that you studied it. The last thing I would say in terms of the way that this will be transformative is that it's not unique to Davidson. Davidson itself has already impacted Illinois, Utah, and Notre Dame. Below that, you see a logo for a group that I work with that's creating a sports analytics program for high school kids. The transformation of sports, one of the biggest things for me, it allows many people to get on the court in their own way. We get to be part of the team. Fans get to be part of what the experience using an analytical mind, and the athlete when appropriate, and the coach, when desired, can have alternate inputs to get more information to enhance what they do in a more informed way. And we are at the beginning of this stage that will be enhanced with the many things that you do in sports technology. Thank you for your attention.